It is good to gather together for chapel this morning. The band is going to uh, kick us off with this, but they're going to let me sing one of the verses here because this is one of the great hymns of our faith, and we don't even have the melody anymore in our Baptist hymnal. But the text is 409, If so if you want a reference to the text, because this is not like you're going to be doing it in your church anytime soon. All right? Oh, oh, oh. 
Man. I like that band on Sunday. Woo! That was great. Now it's our turn to uh, join with them and sing. Now jazz, of course, a little, uh, that was not laid back necessarily. Uh, but we're going to lay it back just a little bit. And I'm going to let you remain seated as we sing, because there's a long solo section at the end of this song. So we're going to sing together, uh, uh, Are You Washed in the Blood of the Lamb? Sing together. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing blood? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood? back to our week of Jesus and all that jazz. Today is a special day. We have uh, one of uh, our favorite preachers on campus today, Dr. David Platt. Many of you know David uh, and uh, probably listen to his podcast. How many of you watch David's podcast or listen to them uh, during the week? Uh, quite a number of you. Uh, Joel Osteen is actually the top watch podcast at Pastor, and, but I do think that David may catch him eventually. Uh, so Dave, keep up, keep up the good work, man. 
David, of course, needs a very little introduction. He went to uh, school in Georgia and uh, completed two or three degrees here, uh, including a Ph.D. Uh, at New Orleans and served here on faculty and as the dean of the chapel and now is the pastor at the church of Brook Hills in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, I don't know of anybody that I respect and admire more than my good friend David Platt. Uh, he has uh, two children, one of which is adopted from Kazakhstan. And today it is a great delight to have Dave on campus and to be able to hear God's word through him. And so we look forward to uh, hearing uh, God's word here in just a moment. Today is the National Day of Prayer, as some of you know. And uh, I would like to read a passage of scripture. And I'm going to ask for Dr. Riley to join me here on the platform to lead us in a prayer for our country. And uh, after I read this passage, if you would like to join me today at these steps and make them an altar for us to pray for our country, you're welcome to do that. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, Paul says, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. If you want to join me today, you're welcome to make your way uh, to the steps as we pray. And as you come, I want to read a prayer that Robbie Zacharias has written for our country. And then I'm going to ask Dr. Riley to pray for us today. This is what Dr. Zacharias prays uh, for our country today. Holy Father, in a world where there are so many hungry, you have given us food in abundance. In a world where so many are hurting, you offer to bind up our wounds. In a world where so many are lonely, you offer friendship to every heart. In a world longing for peace, you offer hope. Yet we are stubborn and resistant. Have mercy upon us, Lord. Our nation is at a crossroads this year. We look to you to be our strength and shield. Please give us the guidance to elect one who will honor you and to respond to the wisdom from above so that our, ho our hope may be renewed and our blessings to be treasured. In God's holy name. Dr. Riley, would you lead us in prayer? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, our hearts and our minds join with the heavenly host to declare that you are worthy. You are worthy, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. You are the creator of all things. You are the one who has sovereignty over all nations. And we declare with the heavenly host, Lord Jesus, that you are the worthy lamb that was slain. And you alone are worthy to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. It never ceases to amaze me, Lord, and to draw thanksgiving and praise to my heart and mind that you are the one who invite us to know you, and you're the one who invite us into your presence. How deep your love is, how enduring your grace, how wide your mercy, how high and broad is your forgiveness that gives us this invitation. And Lord, to be in your presence, though, is, is troubling to my spirit. We are sinful people, and we live among a sinful people. Father, we live in a nation that boasts of its immorality when we ought to boast in your righteousness. We live in a, among a people who pursue stuff through greediness of our hearts, and yet we ought to be people who pursue your kingdom first, that we might store up treasures in heaven. Father, we live among a people who applauds the words and the books of those who deny you, who speak falsely against you and violently against you, 
and we ought to be a people who declare the wonders of your glory and majesty, who declare the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the life that is available through him. And so we appeal to you, Lord. We appeal to your great love and your loving kindness. We appeal to your name, the Lord, the Lord, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness, to your grace, your mercy. And we plead with you that you would be at work first here, even now in my heart, to transform me that I might be a vessel to transform those around me. Father, that you would be at work in this, this seminary and in this city, that your spirit would be loosened on us today, even now, through the words of your servant David, that we might use to go out into this nation and where they are lost, they might be found. Where there are those who live in darkness, they might be brought into light. Where there are those who are dead, they might know eternal life through Christ Jesus. And that all in all, the name of Jesus would be exalted in this place, in this city, in the halls of our government, among our government officials. That your name would be magnified and that the fame of your glory and honor would be shown forth as it ought to be. Our prayer, Lord, is that what is done in heaven might be done on earth. This we ask in the blessed and the strong name of Jesus. Amen.
I know many of you have not uh, have been here all week, but I just want to thank uh, these guys. For those of us who have been here all week, uh, they've done a marvelous job. This is Bill on the piano and Robert on the bass and Jay on the drums and Andrew on the guitar and Brian on uh, woodwinds and flugel. Would you give them another hand, please? And uh, it's our turn to join with them one more time. And let's sing one of our good gospel hymns, Nothing But the Blood. Just go ahead and stand up. Let's uh, join with them on this. Let's try it this way. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the blood that makes me white as snow. No other cause I know. Nothing but the blood.
Amen. You may be seated. Hey. Well, good morning. Do you have a Bible? And I hope you do. Let me invite you to open with me to Exodus. Exodus chapter 33. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the first and last. He is the final amen. He is the author of life, the ancient of days. He is the bread of life. He is Christ, our creator, our deliverer. He is our everlasting father. He is God. He is the good shepherd, the great shepherd, the great high priest, the holy one. He is the image of the invisible God. He is the great I am. He is the judge of the living and the dead. He is king of kings and lord of lords. He is majestic and mighty and no one compares to him. He is the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. He is the power of God. He is the resurrection and the life, the supreme sacrifice, the way, the truth, and the life. He is the very Word of God made flesh. Jesus is all of these things. And we have reduced Him to a poor puny Savior who is just begging for you to accept Him. Accept Him. As if Jesus needed to be accepted by you. Jesus doesn't need our acceptance. He is infinitely worthy of all glory in all the universe. He doesn't need you or me at all. We need Him. We are desperately in need of Him. For every breath we breathe, the only reason your heart is beating at this moment is because Jesus Himself is giving it rhythm. Where did we get the idea that Jesus needed us to ex accept Him? Have we forgotten our need for Him? I want to share with you this morning National Day of Prayer and based on the overflow of some of the things the Lord has been teaching me recently. I've been a pastor for a little less than two years now and uh, I'll let you in on a secret. I'm absolutely clueless. If you could not share that with the church at Brook Hills, I would, <laughs> I would appreciate that. But I'm, I'm clueless about how to pastor. I don't say that to be self-effacing. It's, it's true, I promise, on a daily basis. And one of the things I have become most convicted about, God has convicted my heart about, really since the start of this year, is how little desperation there has been in me for Him. I am convinced that we have, and I don't think it's just at Brook Hills, I think it's across the board, I think we in the church have created a means and methods for doing church that in the end require little, if any, help at all from the Holy Spirit of God. The reality is, we can organize and program and create ministry and it can go extremely smooth and it can even be successful in our church culture and we get to the end of it and realize that the Spirit has been completely absent from it. We don't have to fast and pray for the church to grow. We can market for that to happen. We don't have to pray for the crowds to come to Christ. We have 
publicity for that. And we have made a huge mistake in our country, mistaking the presence of physical bodies in a church building for the existence of spiritual life in a community. And I am convinced that one of the greatest hindrances to the advancement of the gospel in our culture is the attempt of the church of God to do the work of God, God apart from the power of the Spirit of God. Maybe the greatest hindrance to the advancement of the gospel is not the self-indulgent immorality of our culture, but the self-sufficient mentality of the church. And so I want to ask you one simple question this morning. Are you dependent on yourself? Or are you desperate for His Spirit? Are you dependent on yourself? Or are you desperate for His Spirit? And I want to bring us to Exodus chapter 33. Start with me in verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Leave this place. You and the people you brought up out of Egypt and go up to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey. But I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people. And I might destroy you on the way. Skip with me over to verse 15. Moses said to God, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked, because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. God, we pray that you would help us this morning to consider the danger of trying to move one step forward apart from the fullness of your presence. And God, we pray that your spirit desperation for your spirit would ignite in our hearts a passion that would cause us to cry out day and night, God, show us your glory. We want to see your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The background here, I'm guessing, is familiar to most of us. You know, the people of God were slaves in Egypt. And God miraculously delivered them out of that slavery through the plagues, eventually the Passover. And he brings them out and he brings them to the Red Sea and sea parts in front of them. And they go through the middle and they look in their rearview mirrors and the water comes crashing down on the Egyptians behind them. They begin to journey and God leads them with a pillar of cloud, a pillar of fire. They come to Mount Sinai where God gives them his word by his grace, his commandments. God reveals himself in such a, a powerful way, gives them his word. And you know that while Moses was meeting with God on the mountain, the people of God in Exodus chapter 32 were at the base of the mountain and they had taken a golden calf, formed it together and bowed down and worshipped it and indulged in all kinds of revelry. And when Moses comes down from the mountain and sees what has happened, he begins, he's Exodus 32, an incredible picture of intercession for the people of God. He gets down the mountain. 3,000 people end up dying at the end of Exodus chapter 32. All leads into Exodus 33. When God says these words to Moses, he says, I have promised you this land. I've told your descendants that this land will be yours. And so go up and take the land. It's yours. But then he drops the bomb in verse 3. But I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. You go to the land, but you won't have me going with you. And so Moses, the people of Israel, faced with a decision. Should we go to the land without the presence of God? And I would ask, what, 
What do you think? How do you think you would respond? How do you think we would respond in this situation? You can have the promises of God, but you won't have the presence of God with you. Don't answer that question too fast. I know we are a very super spiritual people in this room this morning. We think, well, of course, we would do exactly what Moses has done. But, but haven't we created a Christianity that delights in getting the promises of God regardless of the presence of God? Haven't we created a salvation that is summed up by praying a superstitious prayer and going on to live your life however you want, not living with Him as Savior and God? You prayed the prayer, though, and you have heaven, regardless of the presence of God. It's blasphemy. You don't go to heaven if you don't want God. And we have made the mistake, even in our evangelism, of God forgive us, showing His gifts apart from His presence. You come to Christ, you listen to popular evangelistic invitations, you come to Christ, you get forgiveness, you get a great life, you get your best life, Tony, you get your all of these different things, you get heaven, you get all these different things. That's not true. You come to Christ, you get God. And all of these things flow from God, but you don't... You don't go to heaven if you don't want God. We've offered His gifts apart from Himself. This is the picture that Moses, the people of Israel, are faced with. That we want the promises of God apart from the presence of God. And Moses says, I'm not moving one step forward without the fullness of your presence with us. And I want to show you in this passage four reasons why we must say the exact same thing in our lives, the ministries God entrusts us, the churches that we are a part of. Four reasons why we must be desperate for His presence. Number one, because we have an assignment we cannot fulfill. We have an assignment we cannot fulfill. I want to begin to fill in the blanks here. I want you to look with me at verse 12, the verses we skipped over. Look with me at verse 12. We have an assignment we can't fulfill. Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your way, so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. Here's the picture that's going on here. Moses is saying to God, God, you've told me to lead this people, but the reality is, if you don't go with me, there's no chance I can lead these people. There's an obvious discrepancy between what you're telling me to do and the resources that I have to do it if you don't go with me. It's not possible. He says, I can't go unless you go with me. You've not let me know all of these things. You've not shown me your ways. And what he's articulating here is a principle that Jonathan Edwards so clearly articulated in the middle of the Great Awakening. It's a simple truth. Sounds extremely simple in the core, but we miss it. Jonathan Edwards said, only God is able to do the work of God. Only God is able to do the work of God. Now that sounds, well, of course, of course, only God can do the work of God. But this is where we come face to face with the, with the fact that we do not realize, and I include myself in this, we do not realize the depth of our impotence when it comes to life and ministry. We do not realize that there is absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing we can do as a, as a husband or a wife, as a mom or a dad, as a minister of the gospel, as a preacher of the gospel. There's absolutely nothing we can do of any eternal significance apart from the fullness of the presence of God. We can't. Do anything. It's not about what we bring to the table. This is the truth we see all over Scripture, and it's what Moses is appealing to. I remember when I was praying about the possibility of going to Brook Hills and agonizing through that, that whole process. And one of the things I began to think, and I began to share, I began to say, and for a long time I said it, said, this is a church with so many resources, people, gifts, skills, passions, Financial resources, all of it together. If this church, with all that it has, can get behind a global mission, this church can shake the nations for His glory. And what I've realized is that is completely wrong thinking. It's not biblical thinking. And here's why. Because it doesn't matter how many resources this church has. How many people, how much money, how many gifts, how many skills, how many talented leaders. It doesn't matter. Apart from the power of the Holy Spirit of God, this church will do absolutely nothing for the sake of the nations. 
In fact, the contrary is true. This church could have the least number of resources, the least gifted or passionate people, the least talented people. And that kind of church, with the power of the Holy Spirit of God, can shake the nations for His glory. Do we believe this? Do you believe that you can do more in your life and ministry and your church in the next 100 days with the power of the Holy Spirit than you could in the next 100 years without His power? Do we have that kind of desperation for the Spirit of God? Do we realize we have an assignment in front of us? There are over a billion people who haven't even heard His name. If that is true, then how in the world are we going to make a difference in that? Apart from the power of the presence of God, this must make us desperate for the Spirit. Desperate for the presence of Christ. We must cry out, Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ above me, Christ beneath me, Christ to my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I rise, Christ when I sit, Christ when I stand, Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every heart that thinks of me, Christ in every mouth that speaks of me, Christ in everything. We need Christ in everything. We have an assignment we cannot fulfill. We must be desperate for His Spirit. Second reason. Because we have a privilege we cannot forsake. We have a privilege we can't forsake. I love this picture. We just read it at the end of verse 12 and verse 13. Did you hear the intimacy here between Moses and God? You have said, he says to God, I know you by name and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you. And continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. This intimacy, it's really summed up back in verse, verse 11 of Exodus 33. What did, what did the Bible say there? Listen to this. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. If that verse does not astound you, you do not know God. Face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Now, we know this is not literally face to face. We see later on, God says, if you were to see me, uh, you would be obliterated. And so, by nature of the fact that Moses is still alive at the end of Exodus 33, we know he's not literally seen face of God. But the picture of intimacy is so beautiful and strong. In fact, back up even more. Go to verse 7. Now, I want you to picture this with me, almost like you've never heard this before. Just imagine this happening. Put yourself in the scene here. Exodus 33, 7. Now, Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And listen to this. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrances to their tents watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshipped, each at the entrance to his tent. Can you just imagine? I mean, you are chilling in your tent one day, and all of a sudden word starts getting around that Moses is headed, headed out to the tent. And so everybody gets up and you start going out and you stand in front of your tent. And you watch as Moses walks in front of you. And everybody else is standing in front of their tents. And you watch Moses walk down. And every eye is fixed on him as he walks into a tent. A pillar of cloud envelops that tent. And all the thousands of the people of God are standing and worshiping at the thought that a man is meeting with God. Catch the gravity of this scene. But this is one of the places we cannot leave Exodus chapter 33 in the Old Testament. Ladies and gentlemen, I remind you that you get to the New Testament by the blood of Christ, His ascension, His sending the Holy Spirit. There is not a place where one of us gets the privilege of meeting with God. Ladies and gentlemen, you and I have the unhindered privilege day and night of communing with this God. We don't have to go to a tent, in fact. Ladies and gentlemen, you are the tent. You have the presence of God dwelling inside of you with that privilege that was reserved in this way in Exodus chapter 33 for one man with such awe, with that privilege in every single one of our lives that how, cannot, how can we not spend our lives and our ministries at the 
feet of Jesus Christ? How can we not spend our lives and our ministries seeking Him, getting to know Him? How can we become so busy doing stuff when we have this privilege? He says it in John 15. Not called you servants. I've called you friends. The servant does not know his master's business. John chapter 16, verse 12 through 15. He reminds us all that the Father has has been given to him. All that he has, he gives to us. Through who? Through his spirit. What an incredible privilege. We cannot forsake this privilege. That's why we must be desperate for the spirit. I need to move on. We have... Assignment we can't fulfill, privilege we can't forsake. Third, we have a family we cannot forget. Now, here's where it gets really interesting, even kind of weird. I want you to look with me at verse, uh, well, we read verse 12 and 13. We saw, Moses is saying, I can't go forward without your presence. And now here's where it gets really interesting. Verse 14, the Lord replies to Moses, follow, listen to what God says. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. So listen to what Moses says back to him. Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. Now, do you see kind of a a disconnect there? I mean, it's like, guys, have you ever had a a time when, uh, maybe married guys, when you are are talking to your wife, or maybe she's talking to you, and... uh, and, and she's talking and, and, and talking and, and talking and, uh, and about the middle of that talking, uh, you kind of, kind of tune out. Um, I mean, you're looking at her. It's like you're listening, but you're in a totally different world. And uh, I, I've heard this happen to some guys. It's never happened to me, but, uh, there's a rumor. I have a friend who, uh, this happened to once and, uh, um, and, and all of a sudden she stops talking and there's this awkward silence and you realize, oh no, she's finished. And, and she's probably said something that should be eliciting a response from me, and I, I, I have no idea what to respond to. And so, um, so my friend told me. And, uh, and, and then she says those dreaded words. She says, were you not listening to me? And you're like, well, of course I was. Uh, I was just processing through this. This is like one of those moments. I mean, God says to Moses, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Moses said to him, if your presence did not go with us, do not send us up from here. It's like, Moses, come on, man. Like you're meeting with God. You don't don't tune out. You don't daydream. Like he just said he'll go with you, and you said, well, if you don't go with us, then don't send us up. Come on. Well, thankfully, Moses has not made this mistake, this error in his communication with God. What's really interesting, you look at verse 14. And God says, my presence will go with you. You might circle that word and write a little note to the side that says singular. You, one person. My presence will go with you, Moses, and I will give you singular. Moses, I will give you rest. God just promised to go with Moses and to give Moses rest. Moses replies, he says, if your presence does not go with who? With us. Do not send us up from here. Us permeates the the next couple of verses. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? You realize this is one of those moments where Moses is responding to a, a dilemma that you and I may or may not respond in the same way to. I mean, you think about it. This was Moses' chance to say good riddance to the rest of these guys. They'd been unfaithful time after time after time after time. They'd been obstinate. This is Moses' chance to walk out of the tent and see all the people standing there and saying, you guys, good luck. I'm going on with the presence of God, with the rest of God. Instead, Moses comes before God and he says, not just with me, with us. This strikes at the heart of our individualistic, even individualistic Christian culture, this picture of the blessing of God on me. We need to remember we have a family we cannot forget. This is not about the blessing of God or desperation for the Spirit of God in your life or my life. It's desperation for the Spirit of God in the church as a whole. We need God. 
Not just to bring, and we talk about revival or awakening and phrases we use. Well, if revival's going to start, it's going to be in with me. And there's a grain of truth to that. Because, yes, God's work in each of our lives is personal. At the same time, maybe if revival's going to start, if awakening is going to happen, it's not going to be with me or you. Maybe it's going to be with us. Maybe we need to come before God and to call out not just for Him to pour out His Spirit on each of us, but on all of us. To show His power among all of us. To pray like that for the church as a whole. How we need to do that, not only here, but around the world. I was talking yesterday with a brother from India who is in Birmingham that we partner with. Indian national there, doing incredible things. Lives in northern India. Northern India, 600 million people. And a quarter of 1% of them are Christians. And those who are, in many parts of northern India and Pakistan, are experiencing great persecution. She shared with me about soldiers surrounding meetings, coming in and interrogating him and this or that. I was reminded, ladies and gentlemen, we have a family we cannot forget. We cannot turn a deaf ear to our brothers and sisters around the world. Especially those who are in chains and in prison. We have a family we can't forget. Are we going to pray in desperation for the Spirit of God? Not just on each of us, but on all of us. Finally, we, we have a God. And this is where it all comes to a head. We have an accomplishment we can't fulfill and a privilege we can't forsake and a family we can't forget. We have a God that we cannot fathom. You get to the end. This passage that we've read, verse 17. The Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you ask because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. There's so much about prayer in these couple of chapters here. Then verse 18, Moses said. Now, this is that point where Moses has gotten what he's asked for. And you would think that Moses would say, okay, I think this has been a good day's work and and a tent. And I'm going to move on before I I push things too far. Instead, Moses, after, after calling on a righteous, holy God to go with a sinful people into the land he promised to them, he says, now, now that you've, Promise that. Now that you're going to go with us, now show me your glory. And you think about it. If anybody had seen the glory of God at this point, Moses had. I mean, this is the guy who was on the front lines and seeing all of these plagues and miracles in Egypt. This is the guy who's on the front lines and holding a staff up and leading the people through the middle of a sea. This is the guy who who directed the people to the cloud and the fire by night. This is the guy, when everybody else had to go clear the mountain, this is the guy who got to meet with God on the mountain. This is the, this is the guy who has seen more than anybody else the glory of God. Why would he be so bold as to say to God after all of that, now show me your glory. The reason is, the glory of God creates an insatiable desire in our hearts that once you taste a little bit of it, you want more and more and more and more. He wanted to see more of the glory of God. He knew there were depths to the glory of God that he had not even begun to go to. And he wanted to see his glory. And we see that unfold as God reveals his name in the next chapter. But I just want to ask you this question. Are are you, are you desperate to see the glory of God? Do you want to see the glory of God? And I want to show you the connection here. We're going to turn one place, and this is where we'll close out. Go with me to the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You've got to see this. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I want you to, to go with me there, and I want you to make the connection here between desperation for the Spirit of God and desperation for the glory of God. You've got to see this. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Look with me at uh, verse 10. Actually, we'll start just in verse 9. Uh, just a little bit of a setup. Verse 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. I want you to listen to what Paul says here. And I want you to follow with me here. This is the point of conviction for me. This is where this journey in my own heart and life started uh, just a couple of months ago. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. Now he's quoting there. Where is he quoting from? Anybody know? Isaiah? Chapter 64. Now, these are not just the Old Testament scholars. You've got a little note in the Bible, and it tells you where it's quoting from. Isaiah 64, verse 4. Now, he's talking about how 
I mean, the picture. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. You can't even imagine. But listen to this, the contrast. But, verse 10, but, here's the contrast. But God has revealed it to us by His what? Spirit. Isn't that an incredible picture? The Spirit of God, what He does in our life? Then read on. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, listen to this, in the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the who? The Spirit of God. So here's the, here's the deal. I want you to follow with me here. Just a couple of truths. You put them together. Start. Number one. Only the Spirit of God knows the fullness of the glory of God. It's what 1 Corinthians 2, 10, 11 is telling us there. Only the Spirit of God knows the fullness of the glory of God. You got that? Now go to the next truth based on that. If only the Spirit of God knows the fullness of the glory of God, then second, if we want to know the glory of God, then we will be desperate for who? The Spirit of God. Makes sense. The only way to know His glory is through His Spirit, because only the Spirit knows His glory. So only the Spirit of God knows the fullness of the glory of God. Therefore, if we want to know the glory of God, we will be desperate for the Spirit of God. A people who are desperate for the glory of God, who want to know the glory of God, will be desperate for the Spirit of God. You've got that. Now bring that to this last part, and this is what was most convicting for me. A people who are desperate for the glory of God, to know the glory of God, will be desperate for the Spirit of God. That means that if we are not desperate for the Spirit of God, then we have obviously, it is a sure sign that we have grown content with knowing little about the glory of God. If we are not desperate for the Spirit of God, then that is a sure indicator that we are content with knowing little about God in all of His glory. And this is what was convicting for me because I looked at my life as a pastor and the church that God has entrusted me to lead. And I did not see a pastor that was desperate for the Spirit. You would not describe my life as desperate for the Spirit. And you would not describe the church that I pastor as desperate for the Spirit. And that was a sure indicator that we, I, had grown content with knowing little about the glory of God. And so I ask you, are you desperate for the Spirit of God? If not, then it means we have become people who have grown content with knowing little about His glory. And this is where I bring in A.W. Tozer. He said, were we able to extract from any man a complete answer to the question, what comes into your mind when you think about God? We might predict with certainty the spiritual future of that man. This is huge. He goes on. This is where it's deeper, especially for us as ministry leaders. Were we able to know exactly what our most influential religious leaders think of God today, we might be able with some precision to foretell where the church will stand tomorrow. You hear what he said? He said, if we could get a glimpse all across this room of our knowledge of the glory of God, which is based on desperation for the Spirit of God, if we could get a glimpse of that, then we would get a sure sign of where the church is headed tomorrow. And this is where we must see our need for God. Our need for God to reveal God. Our need for the Spirit of God to show us the glory of God. It must bring us to our faces. And instead, we've got to be careful because we get into this mentality that actually thinks God needs us. It undercuts the whole foundation. I remember, and I'm not... I'm not proud to share this at all. But it shows this picture. I remember when I was reading Tozer's Knowledge of the Holy. I remember where I was reading it. In the middle of unreached villages in Asia. No exposure to the gospel. And we're hiking day in and day out into these villages. And I'm, I start thinking. Start thinking that God must be glad to have me on his team. Then I read these words. 
by the self-sufficiency of God. Tozer writes, Almighty God, just because he is almighty, needs no support. The picture of a nervous, ingratiating God fawning over men to win their favor is not a pleasant one. Yet if we look at the popular conception of God, that is precisely what we see. 20th century Christianity has put God on charity. So lofty is our opinion of ourselves that we find it quite easy, not to say enjoyable, to believe that we are necessary to God. Probably the hardest thought of all for our natural egotism to entertain is that God does not need our help. We commonly represent him as a busy, eager, somewhat frustrated father hurrying about seeking help to carry out his benevolent plan to bring peace and salvation to the world. Too many missionary appeals are based upon this fancied frustration of Almighty God. An effective speaker can easily excite pity in his hearers, not only for the heathen, but for the God who has tried so hard and so long to save them and has failed for want of support. I fear that thousands of younger persons enter Christian service from no higher motive than to help deliver God from the embarrassing situation His love has gotten Him into and His limited abilities seem unable to get Him out of. Add to this a certain degree of commendable idealism and a fair amount of compassion for the underprivileged and you have the true drive behind much Christian activity today. Ladies and gentlemen, I remind you, God does not need us. My church, your church, New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, the whole Southern Baptist Convention could drop dead and turn to dust and God will still make a great name for Himself among the nations. He involves us in His mission, not because He needs us, but because He loves us. This is a privilege to know this God, to walk with this God, and to be used by this God to make His glory known in the world. God, make us a people then that are not dependent on ourselves. Make us a people that are desperate for Your Spirit. God, toward that end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.